Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the final plenary session at the Equinox Summit Learning 2030. My name is Michael Duchenne. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at the Perimeter Institute and also a member of the board of the Waterloo Global Science Initiative. Over the past couple of days, these panel discussions have given us an opportunity to set the tone for the day, exchange ideas, and continuously return to the big picture that will help anchor the summit participants as they debate strategies and approaches to imagining a school for the 21st century. Before we begin, just a couple of announcements. First of all, this panel discussion will run approximately one hour, followed by a question and answer session. Please take a moment right now to turn off your phones, the ringers on your phones. Um, this event is streamlined live and is also recorded for future broadcast. And we would especially at like at WJSI to thank TVO, our presenting media partner, for their great efforts in bringing these events to you online and on TV. And now, let me introduce to you Dr. Michael Brooks, the Summer's Summit's curator and moderator of our plenary sessions throughout the week. Michael has a PhD in quantum physics, in addition to being an author, journalist, and broadcaster. As a consultant at New Scientist and a columnist for New Statesman, Michael keeps abreast of science news and the current events that affect political and cultural life. His best-selling books include, include 13 Things That Don't Make Sense and Free Radicals, The Secret Anarchy of Science. Please welcome Michael Brooks. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so I'd like, just like to point out once again that uh, our summit participants, the education innovators, thought leaders, and young people we've gathered together for the purpose of this summit, they're here in the front rows of the theatre. Uh, together we are working to create a joint vision, which will later be published as the Equinox Blueprint, for a scalable, affordable, sustainable education pathway for the high school graduates of 2030. Now, let me introduce you to today's panelists. Greg Butler, here at the end, is the founder of an innovation enter enterprise called Collaborative Impact. His current focus is a project to radically transform 1,000 schools in 10 countries around the world. The aim is to make these schools ready to work with new learning technologies and within the new education environment. It's a modest goal, and he has modest partners, including the Gates Foundation, Intel, Microsoft, Promethean, and Pearson. Uh, next to Greg is Jennifer Groff. She started her career as a middle school teacher, but is now Vice President of Learning at the Learning Games Network, where she leads the development of digital game design for deeper learning. She is co-founder of the Center for Curriculum Redesign, an NGO that is working with the OECD, corporations, and national education ministries uh, to explore new models for school curricula, and was a researcher in an OECD study of 180 innovative schools in more than 30 countries worldwide to identify good ideas and examine how best to scale them up to national level. Next to Jen is Adrian Lim, who is the principal of the Nguyen An Secondary School in Singapore and a thorn in the side of the Singapore Ministry of Education. I taught his school in August, which was a great experience. And uh, I was astonished by the scale of transformation he's achieved in use of learning spaces and adoption of in innovative technologies and innovative teaching. And here next to me, I have uh, Kaiser Kwopla, who's a, a former teacher who now trains teachers. She works at the University of Helsinki, where she's developing a program that will accommodate the huge numbers of students who, thanks to the renown of the Finnish education system, want to train in Finland. So today we're looking at the nuts and bolts of learning. Uh, we're going to watch the fourth video in our series, and then I'm going to ask each of the panel <coughs> excuse me, to kick off our discussion by sharing the best and worst things they've seen in a classroom. So let's have a look at this video. Education as we know it began with a priest passing knowledge to specially chosen initiates. Then from tutors to privileged pupils. Then from teachers to large classes in the factory model. As students, we have learned by rote, by copying from written texts, by instruction from authority. This form of education hasn't accommodated individual differences amongst learners. We have processed students in batches. 
which has created disparity and a barrier to higher scholastic achievement. Although we are starting to see new and exciting routes to learning, we are also facing some difficult decisions regarding the three main pillars that create a strong education. The tools, the teacher, and the test. All are important, but no single one is strong enough to raise achievement alone. When it comes to learning tools, the digital age brings us many opportunities. Tablet computers allow multiple textbooks to be held in the hand and are flexible, updatable, and interactive. Course materials placed online give access to those in remote and less developed parts of the world. Social networking creates unprecedented opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning. The teacher's role is changing too. In transitioning from deliverers of knowledge, they are now facilitators who help students grow their learning skills. They have traditionally stood at the front of a class delivering knowledge. Now they can be found helping students teach each other, or even teaching students on another continent. Today, one teacher can reach millions via video on the internet. In this new educational environment, we have a chance to reassess what makes great teachers and how they might reach and inspire as many students as possible. The final pillar is the test, educational assessment. What is the best way to gauge the progress of learners? Exams on the curriculum or more general tests of learning ability? Or is there another way entirely? We are in the midst of a huge experiment and we don't yet know what works. Are tablets that much more engaging than chalkboards? Does being alone with an internet connection create a better learning experience than struggling through alongside your peers? Are massive online courses just creating bigger batches? It is vital that we answer these questions quickly and push global achievement as high as this age of new opportunities will allow. Okay, uh, lots of stuff in there about teaching. I, I want to uh, start off really by examining that idea that teaching, how hard can it be? You know, surely you've just got to stand in front of a class of, of 30 kids and the best thing is they have to listen to you. So I mean, presumably, you know, all of you would agree that it, it actually requires some skills and some training. I was hoping you'd give me an example of when it's gone really badly wrong. You've seen something happen, it doesn't have to be you. Um, or, uh, and, and then something where you've seen something that's really kind of, you know, angels were singing overhead, the teaching and learning was so good. Greg, I'll start with you. Well, maybe I'll start with, with the bad one or, or one that I think I learned a lot from because it, it gave me an opportunity to reflect, but I still remember this because it, it shaped my, my teaching so much. I started as a primary teacher um, in New South Wales in Australia. And at the time I started, there were a lot of new teachers who'd come out of college and we're, we were all sort of finding our feet together. Even though we all had our degrees, we really didn't know much about how classrooms operated. And I remember in the, in the first year, um, I was in a class and the teacher next to me in a classroom, who I probably won't share his name, but um, <laughs> we, were, we were very good friends, but he had been taught that his job was exactly what you said. He stood at the front of the classroom and he talked at the, at the children who were there. And, and so one day, um, a colleague of mine, another first year out teacher, we decided we'd climb in the windows at the back of his classroom and just see how much we could disturb the class before he stopped delivering his lecture. And he didn't <laughs> stop delivering the lecture, even though the kids were totally out of control, the class, the class just fell apart. And it, it dawned on me that there was no relationship between what was happening in his space, which was this front of the classroom, I'm going to keep talking no matter what, and what was happening in the kid, with the kids and their connection with that. And so I really, you know, the lesson that I learned from that is it's really about that connection that happens. What's the partnership between the teacher and the students that's critical? And so while it was a disaster, that, that lesson, um, I think it proved a, a really valuable point. Did, did he change his teaching style after that? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> Later on he did. Give me, give me an example of good practice then, you've seen. Well, I think, I think good practice, um, so, you know, I've, I've been able to move on in my career and I've learnt from that. And one of the things I've learned is I, I now get to 
be a trainer. Um, I'm a trainer in the partnership brokers scheme, so it's, it's teaching as far as I'm concerned. And the methodology we use is called liberating learning, which is basically changing the metaphor and thinking it's not about what I put into the student, but what I can get out of the student. And the only way you can do that is build high trust relationships. So the magic that I've found is when you invest in building high trust relationships and you get into learning situations where you ask questions instead of telling, mm -hmm. um, magic things can happen because people are constructing and they're building on what's inside them rather than you taking this view of, you know, I've got to get what's on my overhead slide or what's on my bit of paper or what's on my computer screen through your brain with the minimal effort onto your computer screen bit of paper or whatever. So right. yeah. I, I think that, that relationship stuff is really magic when, when it gets working. Right, okay. Jen, I'm going to ask you, are you have you got any terrible practice you're willing to share? Sure. Uh, so I work a lot with schools and using technology and I've seen many a lesson go awry because the teacher hasn't gotten enough support or training on the new technology that they'd be using. So, um, you know, certainly times where a bunch of iPads come into a new classroom and everything starts to fall apart pretty quickly because the teacher might not totally understand how to use the device or the application on the device for the lesson. And so if they don't know how to also manage the classroom while managing those devices, um, chaos can ensue. Um, but the example that really comes to mind for me, you know, that's lack of training. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily a bad teacher. Um, but too often we see uh, learning environments where kids will get inspired or excited by an activity and they'll have lots of questions and want to pursue them and the educator has to shut that down and say, no, we're moving on. And it's the curriculum that forces that, not necessarily the educator. So you can see bad practice, but not because of the teacher. Okay. And, and what's your best practice that you've seen? Um, I'll give another technology-based example. I work a lot in games and helping teachers use games in their classroom. And I had a, a, a very excellent educator tell me about how he was using Civilization, which is a commercial game in his classroom. And I was really skeptical at first. It's a game that was not built for educational purposes, um, but it has lo lo won lots of awards. And uh, he used the game in his classroom to teach not only about um, civilization development, trade routes, um, what causes tensions between societies, but because kids were trying to win the game and have their own society advance in the game, it brought out real tensions in the classroom. And he used that as an opportunity to facilitate negotiation skills, collaboration, and getting a lot of the things that Greg was describing, building trust and relationships between one, one another. So the game just became a tool for him to facilitate that. Fantastic, okay. Adrian, I'm sure um, Singapore is pretty much perfect, isn't it? No. You've never seen bad <laughs> practice, surely. No, I, I, I can share with you a story from the principal's office. <laughs> Though, um, I remember a um, couple of years ago, um, I have a very senior teacher who was really flustered and she marched into my room with this device, you know, it's a white looking thing. And she, and she came into my office, she said, look, this is what happens when you introduce technology. You get kids bringing different types of toys into the classroom. And so she confiscated this device and she put it in front of me. And I, when I look at the device, I said, oh no, this is the router that we just bought for the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it's our own device. But she didn't know it was a router. Okay, so I had to find some time to explain to her why we need a router. And she's a, fair, but she's a good teacher, let me say this. She is really caring and she's inspiring, but she's just not in tune with the use of technology. And I'm not going to, to penalize her for that. And just in that same week, I got another teacher who brought a student down and said, you know, Mr. Lim, you have to punish this boy. I said, for what? You know, he disrupted my lesson. So I asked the teacher, let me know how did he disrupt your, uh, your lesson. Just I was showing a very good video in class, and this boy hijacked my lesson. So I thought that was really serious. How did he hijack? He says, my screen went blank, and uh, I saw his Facebook page on the screen instead. So I said, how did this boy do it? He says, so I asked the boy, so what did you do? He says, oh, I was uh, bored. I look at the uh, projector above me, it has this code, I search for the app, I download an app onto my, I, my smartphone, and I control the projector wirelessly, and I show them what I have on my Facebook. <laughs> so I said, wow, 
you know, you, I've been trying to solve this problem of uh, uh, how to, you know, in case everything fails, you, you, can, you can control the projector wirelessly. This boy found a solution for me, but <laughs> he disrupted the lesson. So as a principal, I, I have to make the call. So I had to punish the boy. I said, look, I'm going to praise you for doing something, uh, uh, discovering something. I praise him. He was really happy, but I got to teach you a lesson for um, disrupting class. So I put him outside to do some math sums and all that for uh, two hours. And you know, this boy now, he's actually he's got a scholarship to, uh, to pursue a diploma in uh, digital forensic. So we didn't kill his spirit, and we also didn't kill the spirit of the teacher. I wanted to, the teacher to know that there is still some form of uh, structure and discipline. So I think that's the tough job for, for a principal when you have teachers uh, of uh, different abilities and, and okay, I, I don't know whether it's, it's that bad or... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, uh, tell us about something that's really inspired you when you've seen it in a classroom. Okay, I, I think I, I, I'll, I have two examples. One is something which I was really impressed because a, a very senior teacher and a young teacher worked together, and I liked that a lot because I pair my senior teachers and my younger teachers together so that they learn from each other, the technology and the pedagogy. And usually, the senior teachers, they do have more experience in the class. So I've seen this lesson, which I'm really, really impressed where it's an English lesson. I'm an English teacher, by the way, and I had so much difficulty teaching my students how to summarize. Those skills are really important to be concise. So kids are really bored when you give them this text and say, you know, this amount of text and say, you summarize it within 100 words. So what happened was, when I went to this class, I saw how the senior teacher and uh, this young teacher allowing all the kids to take out their phones to tweet. So I was wondering, what were they doing? So they gave them shorter texts, and they told the class, you tweet the summary uh, for a shorter text. And you know, Twitter makes, force you to summarize in 140 characters. And when the kids found out that they can tweet in class, it became compelling to learn summary. The skills were the same. But when they see everyone's uh, summary up there, they were competing with each other. Let's drop this word. Let's replace this word with a shorter. So it was really buzzing. Mm. And I think that's amazing because you're using a free technology. The kids use it and the teachers harness it and, and, and take it to a different level. Yeah. That's a technology one. I don't know whether I can do a, no, a non-technology one. No, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Let's, yeah. let's move it. Yeah. Kaiser, what have you seen? Yeah. Um, well, maybe the experience I'll share with you is, um, it was actually before I was a qualified teacher, so I was before I had my master's and before I'd finished my um, teaching, um, teaching qualifications. And, but I was substituting at the local school, and I would substitute whatever teacher and subject that they would need that day. And then one day they asked me to sub substitute the home economics teacher. And I thought, well, you know, this can't be too bad because it's hands-on, so I'm sure that the kids will like it. And so then I went in and the, the teacher had given me a very good list of things that they were going to do and all the supplies were there. But then when the kids started working, they, uh, you know, they would be peeling potatoes and carrots and they would leave the peels like on the counters and, you know, th some of them would fall on the floor. And, and later than be, when they'd be cooking, um, and cooking's not my, my strong <laughs> suit anyways, I think my kids could attest to that. And they wouldn't be cleaning up after themselves. And they, you know, they just were making a real mess. And I had no control of them. And I, I, and I, you know, I was standing there and thinking like, well, I'm not gonna start yelling at these kids, but what can I do? But I didn't really have any good solutions at that point. But somehow I made them at least sit until the end of the class. <laughs> just, just sit down and stop peeing. <laughs> well, and they, they did clean up at the end too, but yes, it wasn't a, very uh, happy experience. So you need, you need strategies, don't you? You need things in, in your hand, cards and up, up we definitely, Yeah, we definitely need those. And then when things are going wrong, we, we, need, we need to know when to stop and then start anew because there's no use in continuing something that's not working out for right. us or the, or the yeah. students. Yeah. So what's, what's, tell me something that's really impressed you. Um, well, maybe then that would be teaching my own subject, which is um, English as a foreign language. That, um, and I don't think there's only one experience, but there are many of them, um, I think. And it's when you, you know, get, when you get the right kind of momentum going in the classroom and the, the students are actually using English in the lesson and they're um, talking about meaningful things and engaging with each other and interacting and just, you know, just being engaged and, and enjoying the lesson. So that's It's just where that, the aim that kind be. of magical calm descends. And yes, and you, yeah, and so, so you somehow have to get that right kind of atmosphere yeah, yeah. in the lesson so that it's comfortable yeah. for all. So you know, what I'm hearing is, is very much this, this idea that there are skills and there are strategies and you know, training is essential. You know, not everybody can just stand up and do it. 
Um, so, uh, you know, I guess we'll talk about you know, issues of curriculum and assessment. But let me let me start by talking about you know, the, the kind of buzzword of everything, which is digital technology, Jen. And um, so, I mean, how well is our experiment with these technologies kind of going? Are, you know, are we making the most of the opportunities of the mm. digital age? Or are we making too much of them? Mm. Yeah, I was going to say define well. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, we have. Uh, incredible insurgence of uh, technologies available. In the last few years in particular, we've really just seen the educational technology f market and field explode. I used to know generally what was out there, and now I absolutely can't keep up. It's definitely a new bubble. Um, that brings a lot of opportunity, a lot of various tools that a school can use and a teacher can use. It also brings the challenge of finding the right tool. Um, it's so dense now, it's really difficult to determine what's the best tool and tools for your, um, your environment. Um, I think the challenge that always persists with educational technology is your, your stance towards it. So too often uh, the stance will be you, you get excited by the technology, you lead with that foot. And so I'll have principals say something like this to me. Uh, we just got 500 iPads, we're so excited, now what do we do with them? And in environments like that, um, it's really difficult because you're leading with the technology and that typically doesn't mean that you've put a plan in place for training the teachers. It often means you haven't thought about the type of actual learning experiences and the interconnections that you want to facilitate and then what tool serves that. So, but there are environments that do that. And so the more we can share that knowledge and build on that knowledge in the field of education, that that's the stance you start with and build out from there, we can really leverage the power of educational technology. Okay. Greg, is that something you'd agree with, or do you think it's a kind of distraction? I, think, I don't think it's a distraction. I think the challenge is that um, what we've seen over the last 30 years of educational technology is a, is a general focus on acquisition of technology, which I think Jen highlighted, you know, the view of, well, now we've bought this technology, what on earth do we do with it? And I think that's almost counter to, it, to other, if we look at other industries or other areas, it's counter to that view. I mean, I couldn't imagine a business going, we, we got 500 iPads, now what are we going to do with them? That there'd be some thinking about how do we go through a change process and what is it that we want to change before we apply the technology? So I think to some extent education's got that wrong because it's, it's been driven by a view that um, it's really important for kids and teachers to have access to technology, which I absolutely agree with. But I think the implementation hasn't been structured in a way um, where it works. And the result of that is what we see is, again, exactly what Jen said, there are pockets of excellence out there. But there, we did a scan earlier this year and we can't find one system that has been able to scale that excellence. So the real challenge, I believe, is not, it's not a, a yes technology, no technology, or should we buy technology. They're all important considerations, but it's why you would want to buy technology and how do you scale that across a system, because if you don't, you end up with, with pockets of inequity. You end up with some schools who are doing really great and some schools who have technology and it's not delivering on the promise that, that it could have delivered on. So part of the work that we're doing is in our project, New Pedagogies for Deep Learning, is saying that while the technology is important, it's more important to think about what we know about change knowledge and there's some great leaders in the world who have, who have invested their careers in looking at what how, how education systems can change. Uh, Michael Fullen here in Canada is, is an example of that and we're working with Michael on this project that we're doing. And then looking at, at what are the new measures of learning because mm. we have today measures of learning that I believe aren't mapped to the outcomes that technology might deliver. In other words, too often politicians say, let's buy technology now, why didn't it lift test scores? And right. that's a stupid discussion right. really. Right. It's okay. like, you know. So I think the bottom line is if you think about those things and the new pedagogies that you want to see in action, then you have a decent frame for change as opposed to saying let's buy something and hope something happens. Right, okay. So let's strip away the, the, the tools for the moment and just go back to basics. Adrian, can you define what makes a great teacher? No, I, I think uh, what makes a great teacher is always enduring and we heard from the keynote at the opening ceremony uh, a great teacher is always a caring teacher. Now, and if you're a caring teacher in the 21st century, you've got to understand that things have changed. The kids today are born into the digital age, not by choice. So as a caring teacher, you want to find out a little bit more about what engages them now and how to make that uh, learning process better. So I would say 
care and, and um, will always be there. And, and, and I'm glad that uh, the Gallup poll shows that people are still talking about teachers as somebody who's caring. Yeah. So I, I think a great teacher now is somebody who's uh, adaptable and really agile because things have changed so fast and not to be stagnant. And I think that there lies the challenge of teaching. It is not an easy job. It is a job that you've got to continually innovate. So I don't agree uh, when people say that you no know, teaching is the last job. Teaching must be the, the, the first job, like in Finland, where you know, um, only one in 10 get into uh, the teaching profession. And I was told that uh, in Finland, um, I can ask Kaiser about that, that if you're a teacher, uh, you're the number one lifetime partner that people, uh, you know, people are looking for, you know, and, and I think that's uh, something, and, and in Singapore, we, we set high standards for teacher because we only recruit from the top one third uh, of the university cohort and we have a one year long uh, teacher training process where all the pedagogical stuff and, uh, you know, uh, how to use technology, classroom management and all that uh, comes into play and, and I think it's really a whole uh, process from uh, teachers, uh, education school, undergraduate school, so on and so forth. But my answer is care. That, that's what makes a great teacher. Right. Thank you. Um, Kaiser, I'm sure you're bored with our obsession with Finland <laughs> and it's, it's right. kind of, you know, a fantastic education system, <laughs> yes. but we are obsessed, so I'm going to still keep talking about it. Um, what, what has made Finland so, so great a place? I mean, you've got people flocking to go and train there. Is it the teacher training? Do you produce great teachers in Finland? Um, well, I'd like to believe so, and we, we think that we do. <laughs> and in, maybe you know that um, in Finland, all teachers must have a master's degree. So, um, in, and then also one year of pedagogical, um, pedagogical studies. And it's a little bit different for class teachers than is for subject teachers, but, um, but in any case, but there are things that, um, yeah, we, like when they come into, like I, I work in STEP, which is subject teacher education program. And <clears throat> to get into there, all the, all the applicants are interviewed. So that's a way for us to then, um, you know, see everyone and, and really like look at them and, and talk to them and see what, what, what type of attributes they have and ideas about teaching. Let me ask, I mean, can you tell at an interview who's going to be a good teacher and who isn't? Um, well, I'm not sure that um, we can tell that yet, but I think what we're looking for is about their motivations and we, what we want to, we want to have a feeling that this person is educatable. Because, right. Okay. Like, I don't necessarily think that every person will make a great teacher, but I think that if we have a person who wants to be educated and has that, has that drive and thirst for it, yeah. then we definitely want to work with them. One of the things we've been talking about this week is about how you make the system scalable. So if you get a good system, it's got, you know, there's no good taking the best te 10 teachers and putting them in one school and saying we've got a great school, because you've got a great school and you haven't got a, a system. Um, so how do you identify the, the ones that you want, but you know, make sure that you don't set the bar too high, that, that you know, you're just not producing enough teachers? Um, well, right, well, in Finland, there are, um, there are a lot of applicants for the teacher education programs, but, um, and so we have to meet the demands of the, um, of the schools that, that we would have enough teachers, and, and um, maybe there are some, maybe there's an, uh, that we're, maybe we're educating too many of some subject teachers, for example, and maybe not enough of some others. But um, that is something that has to be balanced and, you know, throughout but, the time. So, so it's constantly being reviewed and, and you're getting good results across the board. Yeah. It's not one pocket but, in the country. You know? Yeah, well, the entrance into all the programs is restricted. Right. Like we have a certain number that we can take in and, you know, that's it, at least for that year. So that way, that's, that's what we, we're working with. Yeah. And is it really that desirable? Somebody else said um, it's sort of, it's on a par with being a doctor, being a teacher in, in Finland. It's, um, well, teachers' work is, well, first of all, it's, it's considered a profession, and it is like people have respect for teachers, and, and I think the numbers show that because we have a lot of bright young, young students who are wanting to become teachers, that yeah. it is something that is desirable, that, that got, is a choice for a career. I've got a statistic here that uh, at your university in 2011, 2012, there were 1,789 applicants for the primary teaching course, and there were 120 places. So yes, that's right. So it works on to under 10% of the applicants who were then admitted. Let me contrast that with, uh, in the UK we had a comedy series um, that used to run spoof TV ads um, for teachers and they said <laughs> things like, failed in the real world, why not be a teacher? 
or my favorite was, filled with pent-up rage, want to lash out, why not be a PE teacher? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's sometimes seen as a career of last resort, but presumably in all your experience, it's a, actually a very satisfying career. You know, when, when you're adequately supported and you've got you know, good um, resources within the school. Greg, I mean, have you seen teachers who just you know, love it every day? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the majority, the large majority of teachers go into teach. Well, they don't go into it for the money, let's be clear. Yeah. Maybe in Finland, but I don't think so. Even in Finland, I don't think they go into it for the money. And it's, it's a very, very hard job. It's not an easy job and it is a profession and it should be treated as a profession. So I think the majority of teachers are highly dedicated and work very hard. I think, however, they're in a, in a, in a very complex situation because quite often there's a lot of policy and regulatory framework around education that would stifle any other area. And they can't change that. They're, they're in a situation where they have to live with that. So if, if the system makes crazy decisions like we want to test every kid every week in, in this with a battery of tests or whatever, then the teachers have to do that because that's the regulatory framework. I think one of the challenges that, that teachers and education systems face is getting that regulatory and the policy framework right to give teachers the freedom, the capability to be the great people that they are. And it's, into, it's, not, I mean, I, it's not just chance, I think, that in Finland they've taken an approach of not testing the kids every week and not having a strong focus on national testing. And Kaiser can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think you know, we're starting to see that the, the countries who try and drive change through tight accountability, through um, acquisition focus in technology aren't being successful. So I think we've got to rethink some of those things and say how do we allow the professionals, teachers, to do the great job that they should do and most of them can do given the right settings. Right. Adrian, I mean, you're a principal. Uh, do you see that as part of your job as a filter and protecting your teachers and enabling them to get on with the work? Yes, I, I see myself with a target bot behind my back. You know, um, I get shot all the time, you know, with, uh, and, and I have to make a call. I, but my fundamental belief is that um, you, if you take good care of your teachers, they will take very good care of your uh, students. So I, I try to shield my teachers. There, there will always be tons of uh, things coming in. Now, some, you, you just have to prioritize. You, it's like a buffet. You can't gorge yourself silly with all the things. And I think sometimes uh, 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 the school leader or the principal must make a call what is really important first, settle that first. And, and so you've got to make a call. If, if you want to do everything, I think the people who suffer will be your students and, of course, your teachers. So I think uh, my belief is that uh, school leadership is really key. So if, if we can put good principals in our school, uh, who's an instructional leader as well as somebody who cares, I think that, that, that will help turn around school, whether you have the technology or uh, no technology, I think that's uh, fundamental. And I'm glad, again, the keynote speaker hit the nail on the head. He puts a diagram with the principal, teachers and the students, and that's how you get a, a, a successful school. But um, let me ask you, I mean, you, you don't just have the ministry, presumably you also have parents yes. who want them, you want their students to be, le or children to be learning in certain ways. Mm. Do, you, do you kind of have to keep the parents at bay as well? Yes, of course. I, I, in fact, when I leave Canada this Friday, the first thing I'm going to do is meet 300 parents. So it's inevitable because there's a certain level of accountability and I feel accountable to all the parents. And I would always update my parents what's going on in the school. And what, but what, what changed in my school is, I'm beginning to get my students uh, to present some of the things that they have learned uh, during such uh, uh, parent-teacher uh, conferences. So where the kids share with the, the parents what the kind of time that they spend on a project. And so there's always that, things, uh, that particular event where the parents don't see. The parents tend to see only the report book and the homework. They don't see the process that takes place in the classroom. So I thought it would be good to make that visible to the parents when they come for a meeting instead of putting the report book in front of them and tell them the facts as it is. So I think the process is, as in, in fact, more important than the product. So right. that kind of communication, I think, is important. 
Nice. Can I jump, jump in here yeah. a little bit too? I, I think uh, I agree with Adrian about the, um, you know, having a great leader in the schools and, and it's a, the teachers doing their job and then it's the students. But um, I don't think we need to keep the, or I don't think we should keep the parents at bay, I think, as you said, but we need to get, we, they want to be involved and we need to have um, smooth interaction with the parents because they can be a great resource. Mm. But there, there are also a host of other people working in the schools. The, um, there are the school curators, psychologists, oh, nurses, yeah. and other welfare professionals that can also be um, of help, especially with students who need uh, more special care, like, you know, like with special yeah. need, uh, education and stuff. And presumably, Jen, uh, when you're talking about digital technologies and bringing them in, it's great to have uh, the support of parents. You, you want them to mm -hmm. see how valuable these things are rather than just thinking they, their kids are playing games in class. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the more that parents can get involved with understanding what's happening in the school, of course, it's more effective. Often, depending on the context, parents will have deep concerns around the technology that's coming into the school, and that's a good stance um, because it, it hopefully facilitates their engagement in the change that's coming in the school, if it's new devices, um, if it's things like games, but it depends on the context. I've seen uh, learning environments in schools where the parents largely were not concerned when the letter would go home in the weekly newsletter from the principal explaining, we're gonna start using console games in the school, and here's why. And the parents have such faith and trust in the environment that that's okay. Um, but I've also seen schools where there's a big misconception about what that means, and is it gonna be good for my kids, and it can take a lot of work to get parents bought in and, and to understand what teaching and learning will now look like in the school or where we're going towards. Right. And with all these innovations, with digital technologies, I mean, it must be extremely important to actually assess their impact, not just to kind of put them in and then just you know, let it run. I mean, are there good programs in place to kind of, so we can see what works and what doesn't? Mm, it's absolutely important. Um, but you know, schools should be doing that no matter what they're using, whether it's digital technologies or the tool or whatever mm -hmm. tool you're using um, or method or pedagogy, you should always be looking at how it's impacting learning um, and students. We need to be doing that as well with digital innovations though, um, even before they go out into the wild, so to speak. So we do do that some with things we build, but we don't test them enough. But there's a larger movement towards data in, in teaching and learning and that's very important. All right, okay. Greg? You're talking about a radical transformation with the projects you're doing. Is that digital technologies or learning strategies? Or, you know, you're trying to change a thousand schools in ten countries and radically. Uh, tell me some of the strategies that you're, you're using. Well, it's definitely taking advantage of digital technology because um, digital technology provides unique opportunities to bring uh, change and to bring benefit to the teaching and learning process. But I think um, what we're interested in is this, that, that really the investment in technology to date hasn't yielded the results to date. Mm. There are examples. Adrian School's a fantastic example. We want to take that type of learning, which is not just a combination of dropping technology or software, but it's about school leadership, as we've mentioned. It's about um, capacity building with the teachers. It's about having new forms and new ways to measure, and I think that really builds on the, on the notion of this idea of how we measure technology. We, we shouldn't be measuring it using the same, uh, or we, it shouldn't be the driver of the same measurements because there are new opportunities here and new needs and that would be the driver for mm -hmm. bringing in new technology. So we, knew, we need better ways to measure what's happening, the learning and the outcomes. Particularly when in the summit here and, and more broadly, there's broad discussion about we want children to develop deep learning skills. You know, we've, we've heard that a lot. Things like collaboration and communication and creativity and character, those type of skills. The question is, how do you measure those? And, and it's not a pencil and paper test, I can assure you. And so the technology, what we're trying to do is say the technology plays a part in that. And the other thing that we're trying to bring in with this change is, is learn from other industries and learn from other areas and say, how do you build the type of learning doing loops that are very fast because education traditionally has had very long cycles of change. In fact, some people might say we're still on the first cycle. But what we want to do is turn rapid cycles so that you, the, the school leaders, the teachers get rapid feedback about does this innovation work or not? You yeah. know, I brought this bit of software in, I, I changed the way that I teach, I've done this, now I don't have to wait six months to find out if that worked, yeah. I can find it out straight away. So that's really the model that we're bringing. And it's not about us being prescriptive, it's about in fact encouraging diversity 
but scaffolding that diversity. And right. I think too often we try and get prescription, you know, like a, we get a policy that says everyone's going to have a one-to-one -one computer. Yeah. And it's, it's a nice notion, it's a great vision, but really what we want to do is, is generate the type of ownership at the school leadership, at the teacher level, where they can say, this is how the tool serves my pedagogy. Right. Right. Can I just build yeah, on that? Sure. Um, I just want to underscore that point, that it's really important that we have these rapid cycles. And it's not just asking, does this work? It's how does this work in our context? And by asking that question, not only do you get the feedback of if and how it's impacting your students, but you also get teachers bought in on it. You get them thinking about their own practice. You get them moving in a direction and iterating toward a new place rather than here come all the iPads, now we're doing something big and different. And that's much harder. Right. It's not the growth and the change management that Greg was mentioning. I know, Adrian, you, you kind of encourage rapid feedback. You have a scheme in place on a Friday, yeah, your I, Fail Friday. I, Tell us know, about I, we, that. We have this um, fail, fail Forward Friday, uh, you know, where our teachers get together and, and we really trash it out and say, if this doesn't work, let's put it aside. Or we ask a few questions, why? Could it have been better if it's done uh, this way? And, and I think that gives the teachers a safe space to experiment, while at the same time uh, be courageous about their failure and not to take failure so seriously, but to look at it and say how we can improve. So J Jennifer talks about uh, the iterative innovation. So that kind of process is, is really important, a cycle of improvement. And, and I think they need support from that because if, if you have a culture in a school where people are afraid to fail and your assessment of the teacher is based on how many successful projects and not the failure and your school will stay very stagnant and you're not going to move very far ahead. Right. And, and the other thing I encourage a lot is the small little classroom research, what we call action research. Mm -hmm. So what we do is that we get uh, our teachers to uh, work with, we, we keep in touch with the teaching school of course and we design small little uh, research experiment and so sort of a rapid prototyping action research and we get teachers to write about it. Now I must say that the teachers in my school work in teams and so they, they, they support each other and I get my teachers to publish or even to present at overseas conferences, summits, like, you know, and uh, it could be a poster session and my teachers get very excited by that because they feel professional yeah. uh, when they get to talk about their work uh, to uh, like-minded people. And very often they go back, they go out with one idea, they come back with 20 ideas mm. and the system keeps uh, improving. Can I, can I just add one thing, which mm. I think one of the most powerful applications of technology in education, I believe, is the networking of educators. Yes. Right. Because, you, you know, collectively you build this great brain, this great ability to share what works and what doesn't work. And, and interestingly, from research that I've seen, Educators are some of the strongest users of technology out of the classroom. It's not that they are, you know, we hear stories about educators are afraid of technology or they don't have the skills to use it or whatever. What they don't have is the pedagogical applications. And that, so there's a difference there. In other words, we don't need to train teachers ter a terrible lot about using technology. They're doing Facebook, they're booking travel, they're paying their bills, yeah. they're doing banking, they're doing all those things. But what we do, the opportunity is to create this great network mm -hmm that shares what are the great pedagogies and what are the lessons learned and how can I support my colleagues. Mm. It's happening in a, in a grassroots way, but it's, it could be supported and could be done more effectively, I yeah. think. Okay. Teachers often get a very bad press, I think. Um, you, know, you get the kind of classic model that you get from TV or movies where you just see a load of disengaged students you know, um, sitting in a lecture scenario, kind of just you know, in strict rows, the teachers just droning on in a monotone voice. I mean. It, 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 I get the impression from all the things you're saying that actually it's a hotbed of innovation and, and classrooms are becoming, or learning spaces are becoming really quite interesting places to be. Uh, w would that be fair, Kaiser? Um, I definitely hope so. And that's, that's, the, that's how we should be teaching that. Not the old style where there's just a teacher speaking. But, and that's actually something that um, like I tell my students in the university too, because they think in the beginning often, or some of them do, that now they, they get to be presenting things and speaking in front of their big class. But actually, I tell them that actually that, um, you should be the one quiet in the classroom and let the students talk. Right. So it's the other way around. I want to come back to that, actually, the, you know, the role of the teacher within the classroom. But let me just first talk about the sort of physical spaces. You know, when, when I went to school, the classroom was rows of, of desks. Um, I know um, visiting your school, that's not the case everywhere. 
Um, tell us about why you're, you're sort of changing the layout of the classroom. No, I, I, I believe the environment is also a teacher. So it is important that if you change the way you teach, you've got to look at the physical spaces. And so I, I, I uh, got my teachers to think about how they want to redesign their classroom. Now, my, my teachers are not architects. They, they, they don't draw the diagrams, but they, they will give the brief to the architects and, and they will tell the designers, the interior uh, designers, what they want. And they tell them pedagogically, this is what works. If I want my students to do this, they, they have to split fast, they form groups. So, and, and we also uh, think that the colours are important. So every tiny detail, like what's in this room, I mean, this, like, this theatre, it's so important. So I think that aspect of the environment uh, is something that will uh, complement what the teacher is doing in the classroom. And, and, and I think if we put a little bit more attention in that, we could uh, you know, so get a whole systemic change and not just relying on the teacher alone. Right. Yeah. Greg, is that a scalable thing? I mean, this is, you know, if we're talking about changing you know, what a classroom looks like, and many of our schools and classrooms were built a long time ago, it, it's pretty difficult to innovate and, or change that. I would have thought it costs money for a start. Well, I, I actually think it is if you focus the innovation in the right part. So I, I agree wholeheartedly with Adrian, but there's actually lots of flexibility in a square box. Mm -hmm. And that's what most of the cells are currently. <laughs> So I think you have the opportunity and with a bit of creativity you can start to do that. And I think it's really interesting sometimes even, well, it should be more often involve the students in that design process of yeah. what's the right learning space yes. for me. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think, again, I, I try and draw analogies from other areas, but if you look at what's happening broadly in, in office spaces, walls are coming down. You know, we had this idea of I've got a little office, that's my space where I work. That, that's no longer relevant. I mean, people now are tearing down those walls, they're creating open spaces, they're creating pods, and they're actually having a notion of building work that's built on activity rather than a seat that you sit in all day. And what's happening in education now is that there's a similar thinking in that way and saying, how can we build the right spaces, even though we may have four traditional walls, where we have activity spaces? Because sometimes I might want to work alone, sometimes I might want to work in a small group, sometimes we want everyone in a circle. All those things are relevant. And then you can, when you take that, then you can start to play with what's the right type of technology to enable that style of learning and how can it be configured. And generally, it's not just one approach either, that you may want a large screen like we've got here. You may want kids with individual devices. You may want collaboration type devices like some of the new tables or large screen touch screens. You may want video windows that give me views into other classrooms where I can do um, video conferencing, but it really starts with what are the activities that yeah. I want to put in place as opposed to saying let's just bring in and give every kid a device and sit in straight rows with the de device on their desk. But Jen, these technologies are encouraging the space to change, aren't they? Because you, know, you, sh I remember you showed us a, a photo of kids with a Nintendo DS and they're working together and they're together, you know, sitting really close, collaborating. I mean, that, that's one of the things that they do when they're outside of the learning space. And, and, and that's come, coming into the classroom, isn't it? Yes. Uh, technology really enables you to reconfigure things, as Greg was saying. So you can reconfigure the environment. You can use technology to facilitate that. It starts with thinking about the experiences and interactions that you want, um, and then looking at how the physical environment and the technologies facilitate that as well. What makes mobile so appealing is that it's smaller, it's cheaper, it's more kid-friendly usually, and it allows flexibility, allows movement, it allows reconfiguration. Yeah. Okay. Let's circle back to the idea of what a teacher is, because that, that's something that you know, doesn't get talked about a lot. We all think we know what a teacher is. We have our own conception of it. I mean, Greg, what would be your definition of, of, of that person in the classroom? What, what's their role? Well, I, th I think the first thing I'd do is try and remove the word teacher, because I think it carries a certain legacy and baggage with it that, that may not be helpful as we move ahead. Because if we look at, at you know, in the, in the Western and developed world, we've somehow developed this model of 30 to 1 in, in a box being mm. a, the ideal model. And I don't know why that ratio was ever developed. Someone told me it had to do with the size of the classroom and the beams of timber that would hold the roof up at the stage <laughs> when classes were developed, when schools were built. It's probably something as crazy as that, you know, yeah. like I don't know there's any logic in it. There's not strong research that says that delivers optimal learning. And so I think we need to start changing the view of what are the learning professionals that are required to deliver a quality learning in the context that you have. And those learning professionals may be real or virtual, 
and they are configured based on resource constraints and what you have. So we have people here today from, from sub-Saharan Africa where the challenge is having a, a teacher in the classroom and sometimes that teacher isn't there and the capabilities of those teachers. I think we can start to play with different models and say maybe the, the knowledge base comes virtually and the caring base comes locally. And right. so when we start to play with it, we can lift the quality because we're not taking this as a box view and say every teacher is the same no matter where they are. Right. Kaiser, so do, do you feel you have to change your students' conception of what a teacher is, what it is they're going to become? Uh, maybe it's rather that we have to change the teacher's conception of how they work in the classroom because most of us have had teachers who were you know, talking in front of the class and it wasn't as activating as, as we would like learning and schools to be nowadays. So if we're just following the examples that our teachers did, well then we're not changing anything. And um, I kind of like the word teacher, by the way, so I don't think there's any need to change that. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that the teacher has to be there to um, support and to guide, inspire. Sometimes you help the student find their own motivation inside them and, um, and their, you know, the drive that, the, that every student has for something, some kind of learning inside them. And, and in a typical classroom, in your experience, there's not just there's not always just one mm. professional in there, is there? There can be learning support people and... Um, yeah, well in Finland at least there could be a uh, teacher's assistant or they could be a special education teacher. But there's a, there are also um, innovative teachers who are co-teaching or peer teaching. So there might be um, two classes or even three classes put together and there are uh, three teachers uh, helping the students. And, and in those cases it's probably definitely not a lecturing kind mm. of teaching, but they're um, they're helping and supporting the, in some sort of a project or, or group learning. But so then in that case, the classroom could be bigger if we have more teachers um, to help them out in that. Yeah. But uh, otherwise, you know, like, you know, I think if one teacher for every 30 students, I think that sounds pretty, pretty, um, pretty if that sounds like a too big of a class to me. Like, that's, I suppose and maybe that, it's context dependent as well, but I think in Finland the classes are a little bit smaller, around 20. We're seeing students. as well innovation towards um, peer to peer teaching. So having you know, students be their own teachers or each other's teachers. Adrian, are you doing any of that in your. Yeah, I, I, I think it, um, we are into this concept of co creation. So you, you, I find that a teacher, uh, the role, it's more the role of the teacher that we are considering. I, I would see that a teacher today, uh, it's more, I was sharing with a group yesterday, um, that is more of a learning leader. To, to lead, to care and inspire, but to also want uh, to teach the kids to learn. And also a curator, because there's so much things out there, uh, you know, you want to curate things. Sometimes you might even pull an external uh, expert into the class to help you. So you're not the sage on the stage. Uh, I mean, if I want to even say that. But I, I'm also reminded why I became a teacher before I became a principal. I became a teacher because I, I had good teachers. So if, if you want uh, more te good teachers, you have to inspire kids to be teachers. If not, the pipeline will be cut. Yeah. So I think that's important. And, and I remember this teacher shared this with me. Uh, it was a quote from, okay, since we are at the Perimeter Institute, Newton, mm -hmm. that if I can see further than others, it is, it is because I was standing on the shoulders of giant. And I think the teacher is the giant that allow the kids to see further. And we must not be afraid that our students surpass us in terms of abilities. And I think that's the whole, that's the whole idea. Right. And, and Jen, um, putting digital technologies around can mean that you, you almost don't need a teacher at all because mm -hmm. kids can, can they learn how to, to run a game or whatever, if it is a game, and they, they don't need instruction. They, they work things out for themselves. I mean, there's a, a sense in which they become their own instructor, their uh, own sort of teacher. Uh, that could happen. Um, <laughs> I think if technology can inspire them to be more mindful of their own learning, to engage more in their own self-directed learning experiences, that's a wonderful thing. Certainly the sea of content we have available online is helping to facilitate some of that, and I think that's excellent. Um, I think most technologies, though, weren't designed um, to be used independent of a facilitator. Um, or, and or that they're mo much more effective when they're facilitated by an expert teacher. So tools are often built um, to be uh, effective in any learning environment, which often we have developers and designers of technologies come to us and say, how do we build this to be teacher-proof? And we typically don't want to work with those people yeah. because 
technology really, it's not, again, it's a tool. It doesn't, it, mm. it doesn't do it on its own. It does it in relation to others. It sits as the mechanism by which it can fil facilitate the relationships and the deep inquiry together. Mm. So again, the, the lesson I gave earlier that was so powerful was because of a master teacher who could manipulate that tool in that way. If those kids were just playing civilization, probably would have ended in fistfights. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, you want to come in on that? I, I was just going to say, I think, you know, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion over recent years about the changing role of teacher, and it, it's absolutely right. So historically, the teacher was the font of knowledge because that's where knowledge was held. We now have information explosion in the world, so there's, there's really less need for that role and more of a need to be the, the lead pedagogue or the, or the person who can help shape the learning. But the other research that's coming out that's interesting, I think, is, is from researchers like John Hattie in, in Australia and others who are saying the role of the teacher really needs to be one of a partner with the learners. Right. And I think that's a really important piece. And when you bring in technology, then that actually, in a collaborative technology, you can enable that role far more effectively, the role of a partner in learning with the learners. Right. And it, so it's, I think the role is changing and it's inevitable and it's important that it does change. So we need to help facilitate that change and use the enabling technologies to move towards, more towards this trusted, deep partnership relationship Right. rather than command and control me telling you that you're going to learn. We've only got a couple of minutes left before we're going to ask um, the audience to come and uh, ask their questions of you. So um, let me just quickly get, I mean, do you think that, we're talking about how we're learning. What about what we're learning? Do you think that should be dictated by uh, government or ministry? Or do you think the students should be setting their own curriculum to, to you know, further their own learning in a way that they want to learn? Jen, let me ask you. Uh, well. Given the work that we do at the Center for Curriculum Redesign, I think there is some value in having independent bodies or governments decide what is learned at a more macro level. Um, certainly the learning sciences really can tell us a lot about the way people learn math best or other learning progressions. So there is some value at a big picture influence. At the same time, um, we know that kids learn best, we all learn best when we're most motivated and engaged to learn something, and that usually comes from our own intrinsic interests. So there has to be room and space for us and students to define what that is, to pursue their own interests, and there's lots of research to show that that's the most effective um, learning experiences, that when you're able to do that, they gain the most. Okay, so. um, yeah, I definitely think that we need to um, rethink of how, I, I don't think that the students are always capable of um, knowing themselves what they need to learn, that I think they need guidance in that, and that's what we have teachers and these other infrastructure in place. But, um, <clears throat> you know, there are bright students that could do it on their own, but we, we need the, um, but I think we need to rethink of how we're, what, how we're teaching and what we're teaching, that we're th teaching things that are actually are in the real world and not just separate subjects as we're doing it now in, in many cases. Right. Adrian, is that something you're practicing, the allowing students to... Yeah, I, I, to I, I, we conduct a survey every year on how the students, how the students want to learn, mm -hmm. and that's where we uh, crowdsource for ideas, uh, and, and those uh, information from the students uh, get uh, to the management, to the teachers, and I, I, I don't see why not, and, and I think it, it has worked for us, but I guess the teachers got to be brave, uh, yeah. because uh, you know really when you have uh, it's that power relationship that we've been talking about, so. I've, I think that that feedback is useful for teachers, so they okay. have to be brave about it. Okay, mm. thank you. Uh, I'm going to open up to uh, questions from the audience now. If we can uh, make your way to the microphone uh, that's here on this side, I'm going to invite uh, members of our panel uh, to come and uh, have the first opportunity to ask questions. And, and if I could ask you to make your questions actual questions rather than statements and uh, be concise, that would be fantastic. <laughs> then we can fit in more opportunities to hear uh, these opinions. Thank you. Is it on? Oh, yes, it is on. Um, I actually have a question. I do have a question. Um, many of the ideas suggested today, new environments, peer-to-peer um, -peer teaching, shift in role of teacher, experiential learning, have long been a part of the Montessori approach. And I'm just curious how much um, opportunity have any of you or even has the summit considered that approach to learning when um, Montessorians are also looking at technology and innovation, and is there room for Montessori in all of the discussions that are going on in this summit? Thanks. Who wants to take up that? Um, well, I could say that um, I think that um, there are definitely like regular schools that also employ these 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 methods and these things that you just mentioned. That not only the Montessori 
Um, I guess personally, at least, I haven't uh, talked about it this week. But it's, uh, it is something that is out there, and I, there are um, good innovative teachers that are already using those. But it's something that we really need to um, um, encourage all of our teachers to mm. do. Greg, you know, I mean, is, is education moving towards that Montessori model, would you say? Well, I, I, I wouldn't say education is moving towards one model, and I, I would agree with Kaiser, but I think there's a lot to be learned from the lessons of, of Montessori and other approaches. What I think is that when you get a more open view of learning and a more focused view on the learner and learning, and you look at then how you can enable that the best way and use digital technologies to accelerate that type of learning, then you've got best practices or approaches that others should be looking at. So I think the key message here is how do we build a, an environment where people can see what works and what doesn't work and then make informed professional decisions about what they apply in their own environments. Adrian, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, do you get to choose things like that? You, can you go to the Ministry of Education and say, look, I've seen this happening, I, I want to try it? Yeah, I, we, it's flexible, but I, I guess it's good to have diversity where you, know, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. So you, uh, I, I would encourage my teachers to try different things. And, and well, there must be some consolidation, of course. And, and when we come together, we, 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 we buzz about it and we see what works and what doesn't. And that's the Fail Friday, uh, Fail Filling Fault Friday thing I'm, I was talking about. So I, I do encourage uh, teachers to try different methods. And, but I think there must also be some form of consolidation, like what uh, Greg was mm. mentioning, where we, uh, are given choices and, and we have the professionalism and the, the knowledge and the expertise to choose what works uh, in, in that context. Okay, let's go for another question. Mm -hmm. uh, you started to touch on it already, but um, if we're sort of redefining the role of the teacher in, in the sort of the next generation of schools, um, how are we getting teachers those skills, those tools that we want them to have? How are we going to grow that? How are we going to create the next generation of teachers who can't draw on their past experience as students because it's not what learning has traditionally looked like? Mm. Nice. Good question. Jen, do you want to take that? Um, it's a good question. So I think it, it's, a, it's a couple things. One, there's a lot of focus on teacher preparation programs, so starting with folks coming in. Some of the things that Greg talked about, connecting and networking teachers, building better tools that help them to share knowledge and best practice and connect with one another, and giving them the time and space to do that. But personally, I just think it starts in the learning environment itself. How do we build in opportunities for teachers to try new things, make them feel comfortable and supported to fail and share their best practice, or to share what worked and what didn't work, um, to try new things, to give them access to one iPad or three so they can try them in their school and send them back and decide whether or not we want to purchase them. Those are often big purchase decisions that happen years in advance and there's no iteration. So much more flexibility in the environment itself for the professionals and many environments don't have that. I, I think somewhat we're driven by the current system we're in which also needs to evolve. So, you know, a lot of the teacher preparation programs and, and I will be honest, I worked in a, as a university lecturer in a teacher pre preparation program need to evolve mm -hmm. because they can sometimes, I'm being gentle here, take a rear view look at what learning and teaching is about and try and bring that in. So I think part of the, the critical thing is there needs to be strong motivation and support for innovation in teacher preparation and maybe looking at very different views along the lines of, that are, we've seen in other areas like medicine where there's a strong internship and linked to the current practice mm -hmm. through being embedded rather than have models where it's, it's theoretical and then thrown into apply. Right, okay. Let's take the next question. Yeah, so I'm a, currently a high school student in Kitchener at Cameron Heights, and um, I've heard you talk about teachers who are reluctant to embrace new technology in their classrooms, but I just wanted to know if you've ever encountered students who are reluctant to embrace mm. the same kind of technology in the classroom? Great question. Yeah. 100%, yep, mm. absolutely. So one of the things we look at are changes to, uh, ch barriers to change. So what prevents schools from changing? And teacher beliefs and student beliefs are two of the biggest barriers that absolutely get overlooked. So teachers have inherent values and beliefs about what good teaching and learning looks like, as do parents, but so do students. Um, you know, we, particularly middle and upper, 
secondary students have gone through years of being um, taught the game of education, what does an environment look like, and then you throw some technology into it and things change. It can be really uncomfortable for kids, and that's, yeah. it's part of the process, and going back to the idea, it's co-creation. Yeah. It should be a partnership sure. and a co-constructed learning environment, yeah. and everybody needs to help drive what that looks like, like a blob moving. It needs to all go together. Thank you. I have a question for Kaiser. Um, you were attributing um, the success of your, your teachers or your teaching model in, in Finland in part to um, how many teachers you let into the teacher education program in relation to how many applications so that it's quite a tough uh, a process. But there are other countries such as France, for example, that have the same kind of statistics in terms of how many applications they get and how many teachers actually end up um, being admitted. But uh, France is, is not quite comparable, I would say, in, in the success of their teaching model um, in comparison to Finland. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about um, what you attribute the, the success of your teaching model to. So do you think it is also part of the way teachers are actually educated in your country um, in terms of your post-secondary education or the teacher program that you offer? Um, yeah, thank you. I, um, I think teacher education does does uh, play a role, even though we have this saying in Finland that those who teach, teach. Those who can't teach, teach teachers. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I think that, um, like many, very often when our students come into the program, they would like to have a handy set of tools that they're going to use in the classroom, and they want right answers. And then when, and that's not what we're going to give them. We want them to, um, we want to learn. We want them to learn the foundations of learning and teaching and so that they can reflect on, on, learn to reflect on their own practices and use latest research for, for teaching and so that they, and that's what I think we, what we need especially in the modern times because we can't, if we learn a set of tools today, they might be outdated by 2030. So we need to be able to, um, we, learn to we need to learn to be adaptable so that we can adapt along with the times in cooperation with our students. Do you notice, um, do you think the teachers are actually better trained? I, I don't know if you've done any comparisons in Finland to other places or that you've come across. Do you think there is something special about the sort of methodologies within the teaching, teacher training? Um, well, in my university, um, we have an emphasis on, on research and we, um, like all, teach, all students, they, have, they must do a thesis, pedagogical thesis during their pedagogical studies so that they, they, that, so they, they would learn to be um, researchers in their own teaching and they don't have to actually do like action research, what some of Adrian's uh, teachers are doing, but the, they, would, um, that they would learn those skills, how to look at their own teaching and the results of their students and that they could improve okay. from, from, based on that. Sorry, I just realized I slipped my own question into audience time. <laughs> <laughs> Chris. Jen made a really interesting reference to data in the classroom. I wonder if she and others might expand on that. Hmm, sure. Um, so there's a large emphasis now on collecting data rapidly and using it to inform teaching and, and learning instruction. Um, it varies by context and what that looks like. It can mean data that's collected through online platforms that quiz kids every day, uh, multiple times a day or once a week, and, and teachers are given time to review that data. Um, it varies quite a bit. Um, but certainly data can be very valuable. I think in large part it depends on the type of data collected and we're, we're only just beginning to really get a sense of what good data looks like. Can I add yeah. so, I'll add something rather than that because we've been working with a group in Australia that have been looking at doing a national um, assessment of, of just one grade level, uh, doing it in a digital way. So all the kids would, would take this assessment online, same day, et cetera. And, and what they, they had to scope out, what the computing power was that was required to do that. And just to give people an idea, so far, uh, I think the number is about a million students in one day to undertake this one test is the equivalent of what Facebook uses in one day. So this is all new application. It's really at the top end of, of big data. But the, the neat thing is, because of the changes in technology, we're now able to do that. Five years ago, we couldn't do that. You know, it wouldn't have been possible. And that's only a regular type of test. When you start to look at collaborative measures and what's happening with collaborative assessment, where we're trying to measure complex skill sets, the data requirements go straight up. The great thing, though, is that with the tools that are available, you can start to draw some real amazing con con conclusions from that data that you weren't able to do five years ago as well. So I, I agree with Jen. We're just at the beginning 
of a new age of understanding what happens in these interactions and the measurements, etc. So it's, it's really an area of growth. Okay. Is data a big thing for you? I, I don't think it is a silver bullet because I think if I see a child is sad in class, that's data to me. I mean, I would, I'm a, I would like to find out what's wrong with the child. And, and I think simple powers of observation from the human eye uh, and the emotional connection is just as important. But it's good to have data. I, I'm not ruling that out because I'm also putting some learning analytics in, in, in some systems. Uh, so I think the kinds of mundane things that teachers used to do that can be automated, we should automate it and we should make it work for us. But I don't think we should remove that human connection. And I, I think great you alluded to that. I think that's great because you need everything. Uh, yeah. Yeah, OK. Thanks. We've just got a couple of minutes left, so uh, let's have this question. OK, uh, this is for Adrian. Um, in your experience, how do you remove um, the negative aspects of the power dynamic um, of the traditional model, principal to teacher, teacher to student? I think you need to be a fun principal in order to do that. You, uh, <laughs> you've got to take, take things very, very lightly and don't take things so seriously. I, I, I really feel, uh, you know, for the job because I, I, ch I chose teaching because I was inspired. I will never forget that, and I said that earlier. And I think when you want to work with kids, you would want to have... Okay, I'm, I, I must say there must be some respect. I mean, I come from, you know I'm Asian, right? We, we, right, so the, the, the sense of respect is important, and I think we, we, we were taught that as kids, you know. In some schools in Singapore, you still see kids, you know, when, when they see teachers, they bow down and, and they greet the teachers. And, and to, the, to, to a lot of students, that's good, and, and, and that's the respect they want to accord uh, to the teacher. But in, in, and a lot of that were really young kids, when they come to me uh, uh, at the secondary school level, I told my teachers, let's not be so hard up about people bowing down and greet you. If they choose to do, to do that, so be it. If you want to bow back and greet them, fine. I mean, I'm <laughs> not going to stop you. But I think you, you have to take things lightly and don't take things so seriously. But at the same time, maintain a professional distance that respect should still be there. And I think that's where uh, learning, uh, you know, mutual respect between students and teachers, that the students have a voice, the teachers have a voice, and, and you allow that to grow, and I think you, you, you can have a school. But nothing is perfect. I do say that sometimes I do have to sit students down and say, look, I'm going to take you to task. So it's not an all fluffy and all happy kind of thing because life is not like that. We've got to get, uh, get real, isn't it? But I think on the whole, if we have some mutual, mutually agreed principles on how we want to run the school and how, how we want to work in a school, I think that's the beginning of wisdom as a whole school. Okay. Um, so probably I should shouldn't make my children bow to me. I'll have to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> Kaiser, let me just ask you very quickly. I mean, is, is there a respect and a kind of mutual respect between teacher and, mm. and is there a distance between teacher and student in, in Finnish mm. culture? Um, what, what is culture? <laughs> okay, <sorry. laughs> Within the environment. But yeah. I think that it's a, I think we need to earn respect. It's not something that the students mm. just give to us. I think, mm. and I, I think we all know that. And um, yeah, we, we like to think that there is trust in the Finnish school system towards teachers and just um, a respect for education overall. And that's not to say that it wouldn't be here in Canada or elsewhere in the world, but, um, but yes, it's something that respect is definitely something that we need to earn with mm. our actions and our speech and our behavior towards the others. It does seem like we're coming into this kind of um, hopefully new era where, where the learner is kind of coming up and the, the teacher or the learning professional is coming down and you're getting this more equality in, in, the, in the classroom and the learning environment that we're working in. So it looks like a very positive future. I just wish I'd been born a few decades later. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the close of this session now. Um, I'd very much like to thank Greg Butler, Jen Groff, Adrian Lim and Kaiser Kwopla uh, for the fantastic answers that they've given to these questions. So can we just thank our panel? All of our uh, summit participants will now move into their day of collaborations, uh, sifting through the ideas of a, for a school for the 21st century. Um, for those of you watching online, stay tuned for tomorrow's closing plenary at 2 o'clock p.m., when we'll share the Equinox communique, which is the vision and framework that we've been working on together all week. And you can find details of that at wgsi.org and tvo.org.